All right, well, let's um, continue now in the book of Acts. We, um, I think I had uh, mentioned to you uh, something of what happened last time. I am going to review that at the opening of the sermon, but basically uh, because the Jews in Antioch and Iconium were threatening to stone them, they fled to Lystra. They began ministering to the Gentiles there. The Gentiles thought that they were gods and wanted to sacrifice to them. And so they enter into some apologetics to try to get them not to do that, but rather to embrace the true God and to turn away from idols, uh, especially them as as idols. But now we see that uh, after that event, the Jews that they had run from now come to continue their persecution against them and uh, actually succeed in stoning Paul. But yet the Lord mercifully raises him up again. Okay, so let's begin in verse 19 of Acts 14. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every city, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia. And came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Ataliah. From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. Well, may the Lord bless that portion of his word to our hearing this morning. Now, last time we saw something again of the approach of Paul and Barnabas, that the approach they used when evangelizing the Gentiles at Lystra. And remember, it's different than the way they approached the Jews who respected the Scriptures. When Paul saw a man who was lame, that he had faith to be healed, he could see the expectation and hope in his face. Paul commanded him to stand, and the man believed that Jesus could give him the strength, having listened to Paul preach the gospel, and by faith he leaped up and began to walk. Now, when the crowd saw it, they knew something divine and supernatural had taken place, something that only a God could do. Uh, But because of their background and their worldview, They believed it was done by the gods on Mount Olympus. And again, remember your mythology. There are people that actually believe that, that the gods had become like men and had come down to earth. Now, when the priest of Zeus tried to offer sacrifice to them along with the crowds, Paul and Barnabas objected, and they turned to apologetics. They began to argue against their behavior and to argue them to direct that worship to the true God. You know, they argued why they should not worship any creature, but the God who exists, the only true God, by appealing to general revelation. We saw that that's exactly what they did, what what we're being encouraged to do on uh, Sunday evenings in the apologetic series, uh, pointing to the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and every creature that is in them, including, of course, the, um, the, the, these inhabitants of Lystra. They pointed to the witness of his goodness, again, another apologetic argument, that God has never left himself without witness in that he did good to them, giving them rain and fruitful seasons. And he also offered an apologetic as to why they had never heard of this God before. To this point, he had allowed all the nations to go their own way after the, uh, basically after the rebellion uh, at, at Babel, as we know from, uh, I believe it's Genesis chapter 11. He divided all the nations. He allowed them to go their own ways, to follow after their own desires and their own lusts. By the way, the fact that God allowed them to do that doesn't mean it was okay they did that. It just means He didn't stop them from doing evil, and they had to face the consequences of that evil. But now, He was calling all men everywhere to repent repent. 
And so they must now turn away from these idols and turn to the true God. But we also saw that just because they had a good argument did not mean that the people who heard it were convinced. The apostles could hardly keep the crowds from carrying out their desire to sacrifice to them and so dishonor God. And again, it reminds us that what R.C. said was true. Proof is not persuasion. We can give sound arguments. We can give ironclad arguments, foolproof arguments for the truth of the existence of the true God and people still not be persuaded by it. We might be able to persuade their minds but not their hearts because only God can persuade them by His Holy Spirit to embrace that truth. That's what we mean, or what, what the Bible means when it says we're dead in trespass and sin until the Lord actually makes us alive by His Holy Spirit. The problem is not an intellectual problem, although sometimes it may be matters of misunderstanding, but the problem is primarily moral. They don't want to believe. And actually, R.C. is going to get into that when he deals with the, um, uh, if, if there is a God, why are there atheists? You know, the psychology of atheism. What are they actually trying to accomplish? Well, they don't want to believe in God because they don't want to believe they're accountable to God. They want to be free to live the way they want to live. So there's something at stake here. The problem is a moral problem, and that's why they don't embrace the God that is presented to them in these arguments and why we need, they need, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the new birth, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, as I mentioned before, it was because the Jews in Antioch and Iconium had attempted to stone them that they had run to Lystra in the first place in order to evangelize the Gentiles. This morning, Luke tells us these same Jews now come to Lystra to finish that work. When we set out to do the Lord's work, this reminds us that we need to count on persecution. If it catches us off, off guard, we, we really don't understand how things work in the world. Now, the first thing these Jews did was to stone Paul. Now, what they had threatened earlier, they now carry out. Apparently, word had reached them that these apostles who were troublesome to them had come to Lystra, and they were engaging in the same activity, trying to convert people through this message that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, when the Jews came, they had to do something first. They had to change public opinion. Remember, these people wanted to worship them. They wanted to sacrifice to them. They had to change that opinion so these people wouldn't protect them. And we don't know exactly how they did it. We were just told they won them over, probably through false argumentation, false information, um, propaganda, right? They convinced these people who had wanted to worship them that they should be killed instead. You know, they, they, the wall of protection was removed. Now, propaganda is not a new invention. We know it's been around for a long, long time. When the truth doesn't pr produce the right results, people turn to lies instead uh, in order to get people to believe and to do what they want them to do. Any lie that is spoken often enough and perhaps with enough conviction will eventually be believed. And we know that's true. Just look at our own nation, right? There's a lot of lies being propagated in our nation, a lot of propaganda, okay? But we have to be careful because we can fall into it as well, not just the political stuff, but we can fall into religious, spiritual propaganda that's being propagated by, again, various churches and false churches and cults. Uh, we need to be careful that we stand on the truth. Now, these Lycaonians were not grounded in the truth, and that's why they could so easily be persuaded, okay? Well, having changed their opinion, the Jews proceeded to stone Paul. You notice Paul keeps getting singled out in these, these various encounters. What was Barnabas doing? Apparently, he wasn't as visible. They always wanted to grab Paul and do something to him. Well, in this case, they did, likely because, as we might imagine, Paul, the powerhouse, you know, Paul, the zealous apostle for the Lord Jesus Christ, was the leading spokesman. The one who is the most vocal is the one who's going to get singled out for that special attention with regard to persecution. Now, stoning, as you might imagine, was a very, very painful method of execution. Has anybody ever hit you with a rock? I mean, have you ever been hit by a rock by maybe a friend or an enemy as you were growing up? 
If you were, then you have some small idea of what this might have felt like. The one who would bring the charge against the one being stoned was the first one to throw one at, at the person being executed, and then many other people would follow suit until that person was literally bludgeoned to death by rocks. Well, that's exactly what they did to Paul. You can imagine what that must have looked like. But thinking they had accomplished their goal, they dragged his body through the city until they reached the outside where they cast him out and le essentially left him there to rot. Now, if there was ever a picture of how much hatred and contempt is in the heart of the unconverted for God and for His Son and for His people. This is that picture. And let's not forget, they tried to do exactly the same thing to Jesus, didn't they? The Jews once picked up stones to stone Jesus when He said, I and the Father are one. On another occasion, when He said that the prophecy of Isaiah had been fulfilled in Him, that He was there preaching the good news, they dragged Him over to the edge of a cliff and they were going to throw Him off. And if that fall had not killed him, they were ready to pick up stones and drop them on top of him until he, he was dead. And of course, there were several times they lay, lay in wait attempting to catch him while not protected by the people in order to kill him. And we know that they eventually succeeded in having him crucified. See, that is what the world thinks about Jesus. And by the way, that's what Jesus said the world will think about us as well if we are like Him, particularly if we are those who share the same message He did. And by the way, was that message a message of hate? Was, it, was, it, was He simply trying to condemn people and tell them how evil they were and then just walk away? No, I mean, Jesus was trying to save them. It was good. He was trying to get them to turn from evil. So this good brought about this evil response, and that's how we see the evil, as it were, the, the depths of the evil of that wickedness that is in the hearts of the unbeliever. Now, it may not seem like that because we know God restrains sin, but it's true. And again, that's why Jesus told us that knowing the cost, we must be willing to pay the same price and to open ourselves up to the same kind of persecution if we want to follow Him. Now, one question that is asked about this text is this, did Paul actually die? You know, was this a resurrection that takes place here? Well, some commentators believe that, that Paul actually did die and that this event is what led to what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 12, which we really don't have time to read, but where he is caught up into paradise and where he hears and sees things that are really not things that he can tell other people about. You know, it seems as though Paul was, was raptured uh, he, he said he didn't know whether he was in the body or out of the body, but he saw heaven. Some believe that he died and was allowed to see heaven, and that's certainly possible. Now, we know there is a passage in Scripture that tells us that, you know, in Hebrews 9.27, that it is appointed to man to die once, and then comes judgment. And so we say, well, if the person is dead, they have to stay dead. Otherwise, they're not really dead, so maybe he, he wasn't really dead. Well, we also know there's exceptions to this rule, right? There were those who were dead who were raised again to life. The widow of Zarephath's son, the Shunammite woman's son, the man that was thrown into Elisha's grave. He, when he touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up. The widow of Nain's son that Jesus raised from the dead, the synagogue official's daughter who was clearly dead, Lazarus, by now, Lord, he smells, you know, don't open up the tomb. No, he raised Lazarus from the dead. The saints who were in the tombs, who were raised when Jesus died and came out of the tomb after his resurrection and appeared to people in Jerusalem. Boy, that must have been uh, quite a, uh, an alarming situation. But there was a real resurrection that took place there. And Tabitha, that was raised by Peter and Eutychus that we will see was uh, later raised by Paul. He may have died and raised again from the dead. Now, it's hard to tell from what Luke says here because it says they supposed that he was dead. It doesn't say that he was dead. But either way, what happens next is definitely a miracle. Secondly, we see the disciples standing around him and Paul was raised or healed. 
Now, Luke does leave us with a few questions, again, admittedly. Why were the disciples standing around Paul? Were they expecting him to get up? Were they mourning for him? Were they praying for him? Were they laying hands on him, asking for God's mercy to bring him back? We need this man. Were they just simply wondering whether he was dead or alive, didn't know what to do with him? You know, we're not really told, but we know that they must at least have been grieving because they knew that he had just paid the ultimate price. These are not the apostles. There's only, you know, again, you've got uh, uh, Paul and you've got Barnabas, but these are the people who had come to faith in Jesus through the preaching that was taking place in Lystra. They were all standing around him, and they knew here is a man who was willing to risk his life, who actually gave his life in order to bring the life-saving message to, to them. I think they were grieving. I think they were honoring him for what he had, had just done. But was he raised from the dead? When he stood up again, was he miraculously healed? Again, we're not told. One commentator believes that when the Jews started to stone him, one rock in particular hit him in the head, knocked him out. The Jews presumed he was dead, and they just went on from there, and he just simply came to later. Now, we should assume that the Jews thought of that possibility. I mean, they hated Paul. They wanted to make sure he was dead. I'm sure they not only pummeled him until he was no longer moving, but probably threw a few more rocks just for good measure and examined him to make sure he was dead. And then they dragged him out of the city and threw him outside without any indication that he was still alive. And then the last question would probably be this. When he got up again and he entered into the city, what kind of condition was he in? Was he limping? Did he need somebody's help to get him there? Or was he already fully recovered? Now, we don't really know. Uh, judging from what Luke says, the next day he and Barnabas went to Derby. the next day, <laughs> after being stoned, dragged out of the city, the next day they traveled to Derby, several miles away, and they preached the gospel. I think we have to at least conclude that he was miraculously healed from his injuries enough that he might carry on his work. A real miracle took place. And let's also not miss the fact that when he got up, he didn't, you know, think, I don't want to go back into that city because the people there just stoned me. But he didn't run away. He didn't go another direction. But he actually got up and went right back into the city that was full of the people that just killed him or tried to kill him. And that would have taken a great deal of courage or faith. See, that's the kind of commitment, the kind of zeal that the Apostle Paul had for the Lord now, again, we don't have his call, we don't have his gifts, but this kind of zeal is something we can have, but the only way we can have it is by cultivating the Spirit's work within us, by cutting off the things that quench the Spirit, and by doing the things that encourage the Spirit. If we're not experiencing what Paul experienced, it's mainly because we're not living the life that Paul lived, because you only are going to experience this kind of zeal with this kind of commitment. Now, it has been said that we are actually immortals in this world until the Lord is ready to take us home, that no one can kill us as long as He still has work for us to do, and that, that is true. That's the reason why, by the way, that Stonewall Jackson, you know, was able to sit on his horse unflinchingly in the, in the midst of battle uh, as the bullets were whizzing around him uh, because he believed that none of them were going to strike him and injure him mortally unless it was his time to go home. He was completely confident in God's sovereignty over his life. Now, again, we might question the application. Maybe uh, we wouldn't want to, you know, sit on a horse in the middle of the, of the fire like that, but, that was his, but he did that because he had that conviction. We should still have that conviction because he holds our lives in his hands, which means we can have the same kind of courage that Paul had, that Stonewall Jackson had, to face whatever we must face in our service to Him. Now, from here, again, this, this was the main, main point, but we see now Paul use this example of what happened in his own life to encourage the believers as he now goes back through the churches to encourage the believers that were converted the first time he went through. So we see Paul and Barnabas continue the work. They began making their way back to the cities where they began to preach Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, not to evangelize, 
but to encourage disciples. I guess you, you come through, you plant seed, you water seed, you, you, you have a harvest, and then you, you move on, and then you come back, and you begin to see how these people are doing, and you want to strengthen them. You want to encourage them. So how did Paul do that, or how did Paul and Barnabas do that? First of all, they encouraged them to continue in the faith, not to, to lose their first commitment, their first love, not to fall away from Christ, not to begin to compromise with the world, go back to the way they were living before, but to keep pressing towards Him. Again, Paul knew very well, Barnabas knew very well that not everybody who professes to know Jesus, who even makes public profession of faith before the congregation, who believe that they're in a relationship with the Lord, who even believes that they're trusting in Jesus, actually do trust Him. The only way we can know, the only, is the only way they could know, is if we persevere in following the Lord, dare I say, if we are faithful in keeping His commandments. We don't like to hear the word commandment. That's not politically correct today. You know, we, we like to hear suggestions. This is what you should do, not what you must do. But the Bible says that if we belong to Jesus, we will obey the commandments, and that's how we know if we are obeying them, not because there's a sword hanging over our heads if we fail, but because we really love the Lord. So he encouraged them, they encouraged them to press on, but the, the additional element here is not just when things are going well, but also when they're not going well. Paul reminds them in verse 22, again, the key or the theme we want to really focus on here, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, not on flowery beds of ease, you know. It's not tiptoe through the tulips. It's not an easy path, okay, that we enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, just again, think about Pilgrim's Progress and how... John Bunyan portrayed the Christian life. It's not an easy path. It has a lot of difficulties in the path. There are places of blessing, rest, refreshment. But we often think that's what the Christian life should be, purely Beulah land, so to speak, or the arbor where he got some rest going up the hill of difficulty, that that's what the Christian life should be like. No, the Christian life is a life of difficulty, trial, and tribulation, uh, hatred, offense. Jesus said exactly the same thing to His disciples when He sent them out to preach. He says in Matthew 10, 22, You will be hated by all because of My name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Jesus is telling us here that the way into the kingdom of heaven is not merely by praying a prayer. It's not simply believing the fundamentals of the gospel but it's by trusting Jesus and following Him, no matter what the cost may be to us personally. Now, I know that this creates a stumbling block for some professing Christians because they, they believe there, there's really nothing that you should say has to be done by the believer in order to enter into heaven. There are no works when it comes to salvation, and that, that is true, and we're not saying that. You know, if we ask this question, is there something we must do to enter into the kingdom of heaven if we're saved, okay, or to be saved? The answer is no, and the answer is yes. It just depends on what perspective you're looking at. No, in the sense, obviously, that we cannot earn our salvation. Only Jesus can. So we, we don't earn it um, by persevering or persevering through difficulties. But the answer is yes, in the sense that we must persevere through all hatred and injuries that we may have to endure for believing and doing and speaking the Word of God. That's what Jesus told His disciples, you're going to be hated. But the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. So if we endure in our obedience to the Lord, doing the things He calls us to do, and we do not fall away, then we will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But we need to remember at the same time, the only reason why you or I or anyone will ever be able to do that is because we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is the one who will make sure that we persevere to the end. That is a very, very clear message in Scripture. So we are saved by the grace of God through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, saved by grace through faith alone. We are justified. But if we are justified, our lives will be transformed, and we will obey Him. And we will obey Him to the end. 
and we will persevere through all the difficulties because he is the one who is preserving us. Now, Paul was the perfect person, the perfect teacher to teach this lesson. He had just been stoned, possibly to death, and yet he was alive and he was continuing to move forward. Now, he writes in Galatians 6, 17, I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. From that statement, I think we can assume or deduce that, that, he, that basically those who were listening to him could see the scars of that stoning, could see the scars of his suffering, the evidence that he really practiced what he preached. Again, you know, what a, a great object lesson. Uh, to have those, those bumps and bruises and even scars for paying the ultimate price for following the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, this is what you must be willing to pay if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's what we must be willing to pay. Now, the rest of this text really just winds, winds down the rest of the first missionary journey. So let's just look at it briefly. Fourthly, they appointed elders in every church. Elders are the shepherds of God's flock. They're tasked with caring for the sheep. That's why the Lord gives them authority, that they might serve the flock and help them to keep on going, keep pressing towards Jesus, as we just saw Paul and Barnabas encourage the churches to do through whatever difficulties they might have to face. But it takes time for men to mature to the point where they qualify for this office, which is why they didn't appoint them right away. You know, one thing I tried to um, find out, but there's a variety of opinions on, is just how long did this missionary journey last? Some believe it lasted just a few months. Others believe it lasted eight years. So we don't know exactly, but we do know that enough time had passed to where they could come back and look in these churches and see if there was anyone that was qualified and ready for this office. Now, when it says that they appointed these officers, the word in the Greek carries with it the idea that they were appointed or chosen by a show of hands. There's some ambiguity as as to how that, you know, what's meant by that word. Was it the laying on of hands? Was it the showing of hands? Well, it's probably both. They were likely elected by the congregation and then ordained to that office by the laying on of hands. And that's why we function the way we do as a denomination, and many others do as well, where a congregation will choose its, its own leadership and why those who were chosen are examined by those who are already ordained to make sure they qualify. And if they do qualify, then there is fasting, there is prayer, there is the ordination to the office, the commending of them to the Lord, give them the strength to do what you've called them to do, give them your spirit by the laying on of hands. And so they installed the leadership in the church, and that must have been for them, especially for Paul and Barnabas, a a, a tremendous blessing to know that the true faith was now going to be proclaimed and there there was going to be discipleship taking place in these various churches. And then finally, we come to the end of the first missionary journey where they go back to where they started. They Pass through Pisidia, that's where Antioch, the, the second Antioch we looked at, was located. They came into the region of Pamphylia, which is further south towards the Mediterranean. They preached in, in Perga. From Perga, they went further south to Attalia, which is a seaport on the Mediterranean. From there, they sailed back, not to Antioch, because that's inland, but to Seleucia, which is the port they left originally. Sailed to Seleucia, went to Antioch the city from which they started. And when they arrived, they called the whole church together and reported all that the Lord had done through them and how he had granted faith to the Gentiles. And remember, Antioch is a primarily Gentile church. And so they would have, I think, had some, you know, I think some serious interest in how things went among the Gentiles. And they were happy. They rejoiced over what had taken place. Luke concludes in verse 28... And they spent a long time with the disciples, the disciples in Antioch, likely ministering to them, but I think after this first missionary journey, uh, likely getting rest, right? Missionary work is difficult. I mean, Paul was stoned. Think about the running from city to city, all the dangers that, that were involved in this. And that's not true just of them, but it's true for our missionaries who are serving on the field. 
which is why our missionaries periodically go on furlough. It not only gives them a chance to get some rest, but it, it gives them a chance to come to the individual churches in the denomination and to share what the Lord has done through them. And by the way, why do they do that? Why do they come here and, and tell us that, you know, what the Lord's doing? It, it's because they want to encourage us. They want to encourage us to continue to pray for them because we're a part of that work, and by our prayers and the Lord's answering our prayers, it's helping them do what they need to do on the field. But let's not forget, they're also coming here to encourage us to do the same thing they're doing, right? To do the same work at home, or perhaps consider foreign missions if the Lord happens to be calling us there. So it's meant to be an encouragement to us. So as we conclude this first missionary journey, let's remember to pray for our missionaries. And let's also let their example of, of dedication and self-sacrifice for Christ's cause, even through the difficulties they encounter, let, let's let those examples encourage us to be willing to do the same thing, even as Paul and Barnabas' example and the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us to do that.